our speaker is the adventurer extraordinaire and uh, um, he has his first degree in formal degree in engineering and then um, used that to get a PhD in applied ocean sciences and he's been an assistant professor here since 2005 and an associate since 2011 and um, he's going to tell us all about some of his adventures so it's all yours uh, thanks everybody for coming here in person and online. Um, first thing I have to admit is uh, I lied to you with my title. If you came here looking for bluefish, um, there's no bluefish in the talk. There is bunker, which is another kind of forage fish that we have here on Long Island, but bunker screws up the rhyme. So I, I just went with bluefish. Uh, what I'm going to do today is probably talk about way too many things. Uh, okay. Um, the overarching theme of my lab is I'm interested in uh, zooplankton and fish abundance and distribution in the ocean and bottom up processes like physical or primary productivity that affect those distributions and abundances, as well as top down processes like predator interactions with those organisms. The primary tool my lab uses to study these uh, processes in the pelagic, typically open ocean, is underwater sound. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is kind of give uh, an overview of the basics of our, our methods that we use. And then I've got a, a good chunk of my lab is going to be graduating in the next uh, two, one to five months or so. And so I wanted to highlight the work of Brandon Luca, Rachel Karlowitz, Hannah Blair, and Melissa Leone. Um, and then at the end, I have some stuff that's uh, sort of my research that I've been doing myself. Um, and if we run out of time, then we can just skip through my stuff. But we'll, we'll talk about the students because they're the ones who, who keep the lab running. Uh, so we'll be talking primarily about active acoustics, uh, but we also do a little bit of passive acoustics in my lab. And uh, it's very depressing to me that this is now considered a old classic movie because uh, I saw it in the theaters in high school. Uh, it's a great movie. It's submarine warfare. It's got skinny Alec Baldwin, Sean Connery with a Russian accent, so it's highly recommended. Uh, but submarines use both active and passive acoustics. So submarines will send out a ping, they'll transmit sound out into the ocean, and they'll listen for the echoes of it that come back. And that's what we do in my lab. And then passive acoustics is where you don't transmit anything, you just listen and other things out in the ocean or on land are going to make noise and we can use that information to understand what's going on. So if we're an active acoustician, we buy a piece of equipment called an echo sounder. It's an electronics box and then it has a transducer, which is the orange thing in the graph. That's what transmits a pulse of sound. That sound travels through the water column. It bounces off stuff and then it detects those echoes we record that data and we get a picture of what's going on underneath the ocean surface. So sound is, is really the only tool that we can use to peer into the depths of the ocean in real time to see what's going on there. Typically, I'm gonna show a bunch of echograms, which is what we call these, these plots. So I'm gonna walk you through them. Uh, typically, we're in a boat uh, here at the surface and we're driving our boat from left to right. So the x-axis is either time or distance. The vertical axis is depth. And then the color scale corresponds to how strong the echoes were that came back. So this is some data from up in Alaska uh, where we drove over a herring school. And the red areas meant we got more echoes back than, say, the green areas. That's fewer echoes back. And we can use that information um, to try and figure out how many fish might be in this school. The way we do this is, is pretty complicated and there's a lot of details in here. Uh, for example, one of Brandon Luca's thesis chapters is basically like making measurements of these things here on the left-hand side, creating acoustic <laughs> scattering models and then testing how well they work on individual organisms. Um, and there's a lot of subtleties, whether a swim bladder is filled with gas, whether it's filled with wax esters, whether it's atrophied, that will change significantly how much sound um, an animal will scatter. And 
we go out and we collect acoustic survey data or monitoring data, and that has units of decibels because we're acoustics people, the, that's our, our currency. But whales don't eat decibels. Striped bass don't eat decibels. We need to convert those acoustic measures into things that are ecologically important, like pounds of fish per cubic meter, number of copepods per cubic meter, even hopefully uh, in Rachel's thesis, we're gonna be able to have maps of calories per cubic meter for some of the lower trophic levels. So if we can do this transformation, we can change our color scale from an acoustic measure to something like numerical density of fish. So for this, we've run a, we know how big these herring are, we know how much sound one of those herring scatters. And so those red areas represent about 10 fish per cubic meter. Green areas are maybe one fish per a tenth of a, or per 10 cubic meters. And when we have these numbers, then I can sum them all up and tell you roughly how many fish are in that school. So this is the, the best case scenario. Um, this is the simplest thing we have where we go out, we find an aggregation of animals, and we make an assumption that the animals are identical. Right. So the, the analogy I like to use for this is uh, I need a volunteer from the audience. All right, Brittany, you're going to be an, an acoustics uh, wizard. So I'm going to give you a mystery box, right, that has $10 worth of stuff in it. Okay. And the only things that can be in this box, because we went out and we dragged a net through this area, are $1 bills. Okay. So you have a box with $10 in it. The only thing that can be in that box is $1 bills. How many dollar bills are in that box? 10. 10. All right, perfect. Brittany, welcome to the Warren Lab. We're happy to have you. Uh, this is great. But what if I told Brittany there's $10 in that box, but there's not just $1 bills, there's also quarters, there's also nickels and pennies. Are you gonna be able to tell me anything about the relative composition of those things? With what you know now no like you could you know maybe it's one ten dollar bill maybe it's ten one dollar bills maybe it's 40 quarters right there's a bunch of different combinations that could get there and this is what happens when we go out in the real ocean right we've got lots of different things we have fish we have krill we have copepods we have pteropods we have physical processes like internal waves and so trying to do this conversion becomes really complicated, but we have some tricks we can use. We can use different frequencies of sound and those tell us information about what might be in the water column. So for example, if we had a tool that Brittany could shake the box and it either jingles or it doesn't jingle, right? That would give her information about whether it's paper currency or coins, okay? So that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do sort of in a, uh, qualitative sense. So the cool thing about our instruments is we can deploy them in a variety of different ways. We can put them on the seawall. Uh, I'll talk about some work we did in the Philippines. Uh, that's me driving a Zodiac in Antarctica with an echo sounder on it, but I put that picture in because I think I look pretty cool. Um, and then we also have been deploying these gears in fixed locations to monitor long-term changes in the environment. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about these moored systems, but these are becoming much more widespread in the community because boats are expensive, people are expensive. Uh, and so people have started to shift to a sort of an observatory framework for doing some of this work. Um, and you can see some really cool things. So this is six months of data from the Gulf of Maine where we have an echo sounder on the seafloor looking upwards. And you can see things like the spring bloom happening. Um, we have probably a shift from zooplankton uh, size classes occurring here over this time period. You can see uh, diurnal vertical migration. That's what the, the vertical stripes represent. Can I start, can I just ask you, do you get that information? Can you delimiter it? Or do you have to recover the instrument then? For these, we have to recover the instrument. Uh, there's too much, you, there's no way to efficiently transmit the amount of information here. If you had a cabled system, you could, you could view it in real time, but this is out in Wilkinson Basin, so there's, okay. there's not a way to do a cabled observatory. 
Um, here's some of that data that then just gets compressed. So every hour we would record two minutes of data. And each one of these streaks here is a fish swimming uh, above our transducer. So we can see vertical movements of these animals. Uh, we can actually count how many fish come by. Uh, and if you have a, a special kind of transducer called a split beam transducer, we can actually get the 3D position of those fish as they swim through our beam pattern, basically the, the sonic flashlight that looks up. And so in this case, all these fish were moving in the same direction and they were swimming at a speed of five to 15 centimeters per second. So this is, these systems are gonna be a really powerful tool, I think for a lot of us, when we start looking at effects of wind energy on animals, because we can go out there and I can tell you if fish are swimming in different directions based on currents, based on weather, based on construction noise. So I think this is gonna be a, a powerful tool. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Bunker, the most important fish in the sea. That's the title of a book by a, a professor from New Jersey. It's a great book. Uh, Long Island has a, a really interesting history of bunker fishing. Baymen currently fish it and use it mostly as bait uh, in lobster pods or black sea bass pods. There was a reduction fishery occurring here in the 1920s and 30s. You can still go out to East Hampton and see the, the ruins of those facilities where they would get this fish, grind it up, and, and get the oil and, and nutrients out of it. And there's currently a large-scale uh, industrial reduction fishery that operates all along the eastern seaboard uh, collecting these, these fish. Uh, you can go to any estuary here in New York and see them. This is from uh, the dock in Riverhead, just uh, at where the river crosses into it. It's a bunch of bunkers swimming around there. Uh, and in 2015 and 2016, we had some really large scale fish kills, which have occurred naturally for a variety of reasons for uh, probably hundreds of years here on Long Island. Uh, and there were estimates in the paper that there were maybe 100,000 fish or 150,000 fish that died. So the, the question I had at the time was, well, what's that mean in terms of the, the ecosystem? Was that all the fish that were in the Peconic Estuary? Is that 1%? Does it matter? Is that going to have an impact on how many bunker are here? So what we did, and this is work that Brandon Luca did for his master's thesis, is we did a survey. We did an acoustic survey in the Peconic Bay estuary. Uh, and I want you to note the depth scale here. We were surveying in between two and three meters of water uh, for most of this time. So this is one of the shallowest uh, fish surveys that has ever been done. Uh, but you can clearly see we have, we have school, a dense school of bunker here. These three echograms represent three different frequencies. So we can use the information from those different frequencies to help us identify what these animals are. Uh, has anybody ever driven by a school of bunker in a boat? All right, excellent. What happens to the bunker? Do they, they jump onto the boat? Do they wave to you? No, they avoid, right? They try and move away from the boat. So we knew this was a potential bias in our data. So we actually also ran a side scan sonar unit. So this is a sonar unit that shoots sideways. And this is a school of bunker that is moving away from our vessel. Here's kind of the hole our vessel made in this school. But this let us estimate how big these schools were spatially. We could get their vertical height from driving over them. But then with the side scan, we could get those other dimensions. And, and what we came up with is those, those fish kills represented maybe 10 or 20% of the population that was in the estuary uh, when we did our survey. So, you know, not everything, but not an insignificant uh, reduction in terms of their biomass. So we had another project that the state had funded because they built these artificial reefs south of Long Island for fishermen to go use to, to catch fish. If you get on a party boat, and you go out to fish for black sea bass, uh, blackfish, whatever, you're probably going to one of these reefs that they've created. So we drove our echo sounders around and some of these reefs are just piles of rocks. So the reefs here are these little bumps in the sea floor. And what you see is we have fish aggregated on top of these reefs because fish like structure. We occasionally have fish that are not on the reefs 
Um, but the majority of fish that we found in our survey near the seafloor were associated with these, these reef structures. So that's an interesting finding. Um, Brad and I are trying to get this paper written up because this is really relevant to things like putting in wind turbines, which are physical structures that most likely are gonna aggregate fish around them because they like the, the structure. But while we were doing these surveys, we would also see these pelagic midwater column schools. And these are schools of bunker. Um, and they, I always think they look kind of like rain clouds because um, they have this like little blue blob underneath the dark red. That's actually a, a sign that there's multiple scattering physics going on there, which makes some of that conversion of echo energy to number of fish a little more complicated, but we, we can handle that. Um, and so we were doing these surveys and each of these dots represents a school of bunker that we went around. And we knew how big the bunker were from uh, visual observations. Sometimes these schools are at the surface. We also had a, uh, a colleague who dove in with a camera and documented the fish in, in a school. And so for this example here, that's about a 5,000 cubic meter big school. We've got maybe 20 fish per cubic meter packed in there. And so that's, that's maybe 100,000 bunker in that one school. So we published this work, which is the, still to my knowledge, the only fishery independent uh, assessment of adult bunker, um, as far as I know, on the East Coast, certainly for New York state waters. Um, and, and why is this important? Like the, the fishery, um, that the baymen are using in the bays. They're not taking uh, all the bunker, uh, but there are some charismatic megafauna. So anybody who's been excited to see whales in New York waters, those whales are here because they're feeding on these schools of bunker. Um, how do we know that? Well, sometimes we get direct observations. So this is data from a, a cruise on the Seawolf. These are whales that were diving down, coming up with their mouths open. This is a, a school of bunker here, this dense red aggregation. And we don't see this every time, but occasionally you get some cool things like this, where here's a school of fish and we have these two dark red blobs right above it. You can kind of see it zoomed in here. Those are actually two whales that have dove down, fed on the school, and now are coming back up to the surface. And we know that because they are scattering so much energy, there's, there's literally nothing else they, there can be. Um, it's a little disconcerting when you know there are two humpback whales directly underneath your boat, but they're, they're smart, they, they move away from us. Um, so so we, we can assess how many bunker there are in New York, which is critical in terms of understanding how many humpback whales can survive here. How much food is there for these whales? which seem to be here more and more, used to be seasonally, but now we think they may be spending even more time of the year here. So that, that Seawolf cruise was part of this DEC offshore indicators project. That's uh, a joint effort with Leslie Thorne, Janet Nye, Charlie Flagg, Jack McSweeney and myself. We go out on the Seawolf, we, we run these transects from Long Island out to the shelf break. We have a series of stations where we do vertical net toes for zooplankton. We do pelagic fish trawls. We do CTD casts. And then we're running our fisheries acoustics uh, continuously so we can see in real time what's going on um, underneath us. And we, we get data like this. So this is from last May. Um, these dots represent basically how much backscatter we observed under the boat. So here was a, a large fish, fish school which gave us a big green dot. And you can see as we got out to the shelf break, we had more backscatter, which uh, is associated with more biology. And that's, that's not unexpected. We know the thymetry features like the shelf break tend to be where organisms are abundant. Uh, from our trawls that we do, we know this is most likely fish and squid. Um, so just like trying to figure out what's in the box in terms of dollar bills or quarters or nickels, we can use those multiple frequencies and we can say, here's scatter that we think is likely from fish and here's scatter that we think is likely from crustacean zooplankton. So typically krill, maybe some shrimp, depending on where you are. 
Um, and we can look at the differences in the spatial distribution of these organisms. But what's really exciting for us as a, as a field is we now have broadband transducers. So each one of those orange circles I showed on that, that moon pool plate, instead of just transmitting sound at a single frequency or wavelength, it can actually transmit sound at multiple wavelengths. So each one of those gives us information on the echo that comes back. So we did a trawl, here's our trawl. Here's the path of the trawl in the water column. And we can go through the echogram and we can identify echoes from individual organisms. So we call those targets and their, their characteristics are target strengths. And then we can look at the spectrum or how the backscatter changes with frequency uh, for an individual target. And we know uh, one of the easiest things you can get from that spectral information is information about the size of the organism. You can also, depending on the, the shape of those echoes, the echo spectra, we can tell whether it's something hard, like a, a shelled animal, like a pteropod, uh, whether it's a squishy animal, like a fish without a swim bladder, or whether it's a fish with a gas bladder inside of it. And so this is work from one of Brandon's thesis chapters where each of these dots represents a target that was identified. And then the color coding represents the characteristics of that target that match up with these three broad scatters. So these purple <laughs> dots, which are mostly at the bottom, those are echoes that we think are from hate, a larger fish with a air, a gas filled swim blade. We have these gold targets, which were mostly at the surface. Those are associated with smaller animals like juvenile hake that, that may have uh, a smaller swim bladder. And then these black dots, which we find kind of throughout the water column, those are things that we maybe can't differentiate to, to a specific taxa, but it's consistent with things like squid or maybe some crustacean. Um, and because we have our net, our trawl through here, you know, these are organisms that we caught while we were doing these measurements. So we have this ground truthing of our acoustic data, which is really important for, for validating what we think we are seeing just from the echoes themselves. All right, we're going to shift gears. We're going to talk about right whales. Um, so these are a uh, critically endangered animal. Um, it's been hunted historically in New England waters for 400 years or more. Uh, and these are large animals. They're roughly the same length as a humpback, but they're about twice as fat. And they feed exclusively on small crustaceans like copepods. So basically a grain of rice sized animal. Uh, a couple of years ago, Nat Geo put together this, uh, I like calling it a yearbook collage. So at the time, this was every identified right whale in the, the North Atlantic population. Uh, when this was published, that number was around 400. We're down to maybe 340 individuals. So most people went to a high school with more students in it than there are North Atlantic right whales. So this is a, a critically endangered animal. Um, and it, it occurs in Long Island waters. So, so some of its behavioral characteristics are uh, animals swim down to the coast of Florida and Georgia to reproduce and give birth. And then they migrate up along the East Coast to uh, New England, now into Canada. Well, they've always been in Canada, but now they're going into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, but they're traveling through this region that has a lot of human activity. So there's a lot of boat traffic, there's a lot of fishing gear. And these animals um, just really, their behaviors, put them at risk. So uh, the best data we have suggests that maybe any year, there's a one in four chance an individual will become entangled. Um, at least half the animals show severe entanglement scars. Half the right whale deaths that we see are, are probably due to ship strike or so. Um, and so these animals are not dying currently because of uh, old age or disease. Uh, the majority of animals that die are through negative interactions with, with stuff we're doing. Um, so Chris Paparo, Fish Guy Photos, our marine station manager out in Southampton, um, April, January, no, February, March, March of 2021, 
Um, he got a shot of a right whale and a calf just off the beach over in uh, East Hampton. Uh, there's a group out of Virginia that puts sort of uh, longer term satellite tags on these animals. And that same year, um, they tagged uh, two right whales. One just did this little U-turn and then the tag fell off off the coast of North Carolina. This other one in gold, you can see its actual transit um, and it hugged the coastline all the way up into Cape Cod Bay. So, um, you know, if, if the whale wanted to avoid humans, it would take a different route. But these animals historically follow this coastline. It's one of the reasons they were, they were hunted in the 1600s from the shore um, in New England. So these animals are regularly traveling through New York. And the question uh, we had is not specifically right whale, but it's how are the lower trophic level organisms in New York in terms of their, their prey, uh, suitability for prey? Are they a good prey for a variety of organisms, not just right whales that, that feed on them? So we have, we have multiple species of copepods that can be found in the New York bite. Historically, most of most copepod people talk about Calanus finmarchicus as kind of like, this is the one that's most important. It's a larger copepod. Um, it occurs in high abundances in many places and, and animals feed on it. Um, but what we were interested in is looking at the, the abundances of not just Calanus finmarchicus, but some of the other copepod species, as well as their energy. So these copepods are typically transparent, not transparent, translucent. Some light gets through them. And so you can actually see in these photographs here, this is the lipid sac in these copepods. So when they are storing energy uh, for whatever reason, you can visually see that um, and you can measure it. So this is Rachel Karlowitz's master's thesis work. So we're interested in how the copepod abundances vary spatially in the New York bite as well as with other regions like Cape Cod Bay, the Gulf of Maine, where we have data. How do they vary over the course of a, a year or between years? And then how do they vary from copepod to copepod? So here are what we call bubble plots from our New York survey. So this is 2019 data. Uh, the empty squares represent stations on the map. Uh, black squares represent stations where we sampled and counted the animals. And then the size of the dot corresponds to how many animals were there. And then the red dots um, are, are samples that we took, but we maybe haven't uh, counted yet because of it takes a long time to count copepods under the scope. Uh, but what's really interesting is you definitely see some uh, seasonal differences in where we, where we found them. But this May 2019 cruise, um, we had abundances out by Hudson Canyon and at the shelf break of over 4,000 copepods per cubic meter, which is really, really high. Our average value for that trip, if we average all our stations, was 1,250 copepods per cubic meter. The threshold that people like Stormy Mayo and uh, other people have come up with for right whales will open their mouths to feed when there are at least 1,000 copepods per cubic meter. That's when it's energetically beneficial for them to feed. So we have food out here this month that those animals could, could be building up energy on, um, which I was a little surprised by, because we don't think of the New York fight as being a, a whale-rich you know, prey field. Um, yeah, and this is just data sort of showing uh, for the different species what our numerical abundances are. And there's, you know, zooplankton are patchily distributed. So we get toes where we don't have many copepods and then we hit a patch and we, we get lots of copepods. One of uh, Rachel's interesting findings was, so we can look at the abundance of Calanus marchicus and we can, we know how big those animals are. And so we can calculate the bio body, like how much biomass of Calanus is there. But we've typically ignored some of these smaller copepods because they're smaller. So why do, why do we care about them? Well, Rachel looked at the uh, Centropogies typicus, which is a smaller copepod, but it can occur in even higher abundances than the Calanus. So here's a plot of the biomass or the biovolume of these two copepod species. And you can see that Calanus is sometimes more abundant than um, 
uh, thin margin lactic that is not is centropogies is almost always there's more centropogies there than there is calamus. So it may be there are other species that these animals might be able to rely on them. But again, right whales have evolved to have baleen as a filter. And so maybe their filter is not sized right to take advantage of these uh, centropogies. So here's how uh, Rachel's been measuring her animals. So you measure the prosome length, you measure the area of the prosome, and then you do the length in the area of uh, the lipid sac. Then you do some math and you can come up with a measure of how much of the animal's body area is, is lipid. And we have lots of animals that don't have lipids, but we have some individuals that are at least 50 or 60% of their area is lipid. So they're really lipid rich. And in general, they're you know 20 to 30% uh, lipid. And we can look at that over the course of uh, a year and a half. And we see some seasonal variability. Um, so October 2019 was particularly low. But in general, we, we don't see, you know, the copepods that are here almost always have some lipids in them. Um, this was a result that was a little surprising to me because we tend to think, I tend to think they're going to be most lipidy at the end of the spring bloom, right? They've just been feeding, 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 and, uh, but that's not really the case. So the next steps where we'd like to go are to change these maps of abundance and turn these into calories per cubic meter. And so we'd be able to actually come up with the prey energy available, not just to right whales, because there's seabirds, uh, lots of fish rely on copepods for food. Um, so these are all relevant things. Okay, um, we're gonna jump to the mesopelagic here. Um, this is an example of diel vertical migration, the largest movement of animals on our planet. Uh, fish and other uh, nectin will swim hundreds of meters vertically two times a day, um, the equivalent of running a marathon two times a day in terms of the distances relative to their body length. But you can see it's not a uh, group event, right? You can see that there are some filaments that move up or down at different times. There's some organisms that don't appear to move at all. Uh, and so we're interested in this because the mesopelagic, the deep scattering layers, people have estimated, is the largest fish biomass on our planet. And there are many countries that are looking to exploit that as a resource, not for humans to eat. You're not going to want to eat any of these fish, but those fish are protein. And so they're, they could be made into animal feed or, or some other product. Um, so as part of the deep end project, so this is work with collaborators, Kevin Boswell, Tracy Sutton, Tammy Franks, a whole bunch of people. Uh, we did a bunch of cruises in the Gulf of Mexico and you catch all sorts of weird alien fish. Uh, this is one of my favorite animals because I was like, I've never seen that before. What is it, Tracy? And he's like, yeah, that's like the seventh one uh, that's been caught. And I was like, oh, on the project? And he's like, no. I was like, like, what do you mean? He's like, no, that's like the seventh of that species that's ever been caught. Uh, so really cool, interesting uh, organisms. This uh, is a bristle mouth. This is the most abundant fish uh, in the ocean. And it's about, you know, two, three centimeters long. This is a fang tooth, an anoplogaster that they dissected. And you can see these animals are feeding on a variety of smaller fish, smaller crustaceans, all sorts of things. And a lot of these things you can, you can really see what they are, right? You could identify what species or taxa that prey is. Why, why is that? If you looked in my stomach with, right now, would you be able to tell what I had for breakfast? Certainly wouldn't be able to tell what I had for dinner. Maybe breakfast you could. What, what's unique about these deep sea organisms that would explain why we could ID this? Dr. Peters. Low metabolism. Low metabolism, right? These, most of these animals just kind of like hang out, they're chilling, they're ambush predators. Um, so they eat things and they may not have to eat every day. They may be able to eat a little bit and then slowly digest it. Um, but studying these organisms is incredibly challenging. So we're looking at animals that maybe go down to 2000 meters deep in the ocean. So we need really big transducers on a really big pole. Um, but we can use those transducers to look at where things are vertically in the ocean. 
We also have to ground truth these data, so we do nets. And this is a, a multiple opening and closing net, so we're able to tell where animals are vertically in the water column when we do this, whether they were at 1,500 meters to 1,200 meters deep, 1,200 to 800 meters deep. So it's really amazing data. Downside, we take this net down to 2,000 meters and bring it back up. That's about 12 hours. So it's you get one tow per night, and then you have 10 nets. No, you have eight nets to process. Uh, so it's very time consuming. But it's it's really the only way to get that kind of information. Or the only other way is with a submersible, and your your sampling volume is really small if you try and do that. Um, and we found some really interesting things. So if we look at how much backscatters in the ocean at depth before and after these migration events, we get uh, roughly a third of the animals probably aren't migrating on a given night. Uh, so maybe these animals are actually only doing that migration once every two or three days. Again, because they maybe don't need to feed every day. Uh, we think, and this is, this is really hard to try and sample these filaments, but we think these are associated with either different sizes of animals or different taxa that have different swimming capabilities. They all want to get to the surface where the food is when it's dark, but if you're a slower swimmer, you may have to leave earlier than somebody who's fast. And we, we talk about the deep scattering layer as being this you know, kind of carpet. When you look at these uh, graphs, it's like this layer of organisms. So you may think it's like those fish schools I talked about earlier with you know, 10 or 20 fish per cubic meter. When you actually look at the abundances, they're much less. It's like a fish per every two cubic meters or every, every four or five cubic meters. So it's just because these, these tools sample a really large volume, we get this kind of mixed up picture of what's going on. Okay, so shifting over, to work that Hannah Blair did, again, looking at the mesopelagic. Uh, one of the things we're interested in is the spatial variability of these layers. I, I just said we think of them as this carpet, but if you look at surface schools of zooplankton or fish, they're patchy. We know they're patchy. So the question is, are they patchy in the, the deep ocean? So this was uh, part of the Adion project where we had seven sites along the shelf break from Virginia down to Florida. <laughs> Uh, we put out bottom landers there with upward looking echo sounders, passive acoustics, but Hannah's work was based on these cruises that we would go to basically uh, every six to 12 months. So we're going to use acoustic backscatter as a proxy of organism biomass, and we're going to try and estimate the patch size that we see for different scattering layers and look at whether biological or physical variables may be associated or driving those patches. So what we do is we take the boat and we go out and we mow the lawn. We do these FSAPSs, which are just fine scale acoustic surveys, a 10 by 10 kilometer grid. We mow the lawn and then we slice and dice up the water column. So we grid our data into five meter bins vertically, 100 meter bins horizontally. And then we can look at how the biomass or the organism <laughs> abundance varies with depth. So here you can see there's a, a patch of scatterers here on the southeast side of our transect. If we go down 50 more meters, there's some organisms there, but there's another patch over here. And then Hannah ran, I don't know, a billion semivariograms maybe to try and figure out what the autocorrelation distance was of our, of our survey data. And it's, it's fairly noisy, um, depending on the depth of the layer that you're looking at, there's quite a difference in the shape of these curves. But basically where, the, where those curves level out is the sill, and that represents kind of the patch size or the, the distance at which the autocorrelation would, would break down. And this is a, a violin plot of all those layers for one of our sites. And for the site, we got a median value of about two and a half kilometers. And what was interesting with, with a few exceptions, no matter what site we were at, uh, whether we did things at night or day and at different times of the year, we got mostly similar values. Um, so Hannah ran some models trying to look at what 
factors might be associated with um, the differences that we observed. But but because we we you know we tended to get these patch sizes of about two to four kilometers, um, there were some biological factors, chlorophyll that was associated with it. Um, the depth of the layer was associated with it, but it wasn't. We, there was not a real strong uh, relationship that we found across these very different parts of the, the shelf frame. What's really exciting uh, to me is one of Hannah's chapters forthcoming, which is she's going to use the fact that we have multiple frequencies to try and differentiate that scatter by different organisms. So crustaceans versus swim bladdered fish, and then do a similar analysis to see if those patch sizes differ or not. Okay, Brad's been reading this slide to himself for the last 30 minutes. Um, we're gonna switch gears and talk about passive acoustics. So if you remember, passive acoustics is where we just put out a listening device and we listen to what sounds are out there in the water column. So this is a recorder that's out at the Shinnecock Reef. Um, you can do long-term data collection. I have recorders out right now that I'll collect a year after I put them out and then I'll have a year of data. They're not invasive. They're certainly cost effective on the equipment side. The analysis side is, is maybe a little more involved. And they record a variety of different sounds, right? We'll hear boats, we'll hear fish, we'll hear whales, we'll hear things we have no idea what they are. We'll hear rain, we'll hear storms. There's a variety of things that create sound. And um, we can do, mostly do this underwater, but I'll talk a little bit about some of Melissa's work that is in air. So we have recorders out at the Shinnecock Reef and the Fire Island Reef. And let's make sure I've got the sound up. Hopefully this isn't too loud. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of spectrograms. These are different from echograms. Uh, if you're a musician or you have ever read sheet music, you can kind of think of these like sheet music. So we have time on the x-axis. We have frequency or pitch of sound. So low frequencies, bass notes, uh, tenor, alto, soprano notes this way. And then the color scale corresponds, corresponds uh, to energy or power, right? So um, this is, I think, nine seconds of a clip. It's been amplified just so we can uh, hear it, but you're gonna hear some cod grunts and then you're gonna hear some dolphin noises and they've kind of been annotated here. So let's see if this works. Okay, let me try that again because it kicked in late. That dun, dun, that's a cod. That pop is a jaw pop. That's a thing bottlenose dolphins do uh, with other bottlenose dolphins. Um, and so what's what's interesting is and challenging about passive acoustics is I cannot tell you that an animal's not there if I don't hear a sound, right? Because it could just be the animal didn't want to make a sound. But if an animal makes a sound and that sound is stereotyped to a species or behavior, then I can tell you one, an animal was there or relatively near our recorder. And depending on the sound, it, I can tell you something about its behavior. So cod elicit these grunts um, that kind of go, dun, dun, dun. we'll play them here in a second. And those are dur done during courting um, and mating behaviors. Um, so we hear this, we know there's at least one cod there um, and it's, it's interested in mating and reproducing. We can't, I can't count cod this way unless we knew something definitive about how often cod make noise, right? Because it could be one really chatty cod or it could be two cods that aren't as chatty. So trying to do counts is really difficult, but presence we can, we can do pretty easily. Uh, so here's some data uh, that we've looked at. So this is the data from 2020 and 2021 on the Fire Island Reef. Uh, and then we have data here at the uh, Shinnecock Reef. Uh, if you wanna know about that red line, um, Ask me during the pizza hour, because I'm not going to go into it, but we don't have data there. Uh, but we had cod at both reefs pretty much year round, um, which was 
I don't think known. I think this is this is somewhat novel result. Um, and it's and it, again, it's really easy to monitor. There's an automatic COD detector you can run. You have to QA QC it, but it works pretty well. Uh, we can look at weak fish. So weak fish, the Ameri uh, Atlantic State Marine Fisheries Commission really wants to know where these animals are spawning. They they are not endangered, but they they do have some concerns about their abundance. And these animals make uh, what they call a purr. And again, if we hear these, we know these animals are, are interested in courting or spawning. And so here we have data for three, four months at Fire Island and at the Shinnecock Reef. So these calls only occur at night. They don't call during the day. And we detected more calls at Fire Island than we did at Shinnecock. Again, I can't say definitively there's more weak fish at Fire Island than Shinnecock, but that might be one possible explanation of that. Uh, and then we have uh, charismatic megafauna, so bottlenose dolphins. They make a variety of different noises, and some of those noises have very specific uh, context. So if you hear echolocation clicks, that means this animal's foraging. I can't tell you if it's successfully catching a fish, but it's trying to find a fish. We also have individual specific whistles. So if you've seen uh, Brittany's talk, she's done amazing talks. I think she took the title from my talk somehow, even though my title came four months after hers. Uh, she puts tags inside fish that make a, a noise that's identified, identified with that specific fish. The cool thing about ISWs is the dolphins make those on their own. And an individual specific whistle is specific to an individual. So here's an example of a whistle that Melissa found at Shinnecock Reef on the 24th of June. And here's that same animal making that whistle at the Fire Island Reef four days later. So we can start to look at things like residency and or movement um, using these, essentially, you know, they're, they're their vocalization is a name tag. It's like, hi, I'm Terry the bottlenose dolphin. Oh, and here's an ISW. Okay, we also hear baleen whales. These are large animals. They make low frequency sounds that travel quite well. So we can hear fin whale pulses at the top, psi whales in the middle. And this is a North Atlantic right whale upsweep. Uh, and what's really cool is this one was March, first week of March, 2021. It is possible, I can't say anything definitively, that either the tagged animal and the, that mother calf pair that Chris Paparo got video of, those were both in the area at the same time as we recorded this call. So it, it could theoretically be one of those. Um, So this is a humpback whale. They make kind of these agonistic bones. Uh, they have songs that they use for courtship, but they're not, they're not doing any courting here in New York. Uh, these are most likely some uh, conspecific interaction, but we don't, we don't definitively know that. Uh, let's see if you can hear. Did anybody hear anything when this green line goes over this red blob here? You did? Okay, the young people who have good low frequency hearing can hear it. Um, let's see if it would be a real low bass note, like, ooh, right? So I can't hear it. I'm old. I've gone to too many rock shows. Um, but that's what a fin whale call looks like. And fin whales are amazing. Like, as an engineer, this is a perfect sinusoid. And these animals generate them every 10 to 20 seconds. And they just, we don't. We know some of the context for why they do that. Um, we can speed up that call to put it into our hearing range, uh, which I'll do right now. So that's, that's now a 200 hertz sound, which we can all hear. Um, and so lastly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears and we're going to do some passive acoustics in air. So we have done the, the artificial reefs, but we also put out these recorders. You can see the recorder over here on the right hand side. And we initially put these out because I was hoping we were going to hear piping plover chicks hatch. And so we'd be able to get timing of, of plover chicks. Can everybody see the plover in this picture? 
you can, it's, there's my mouse, it's right here. Um, here's a better picture of a plover, right? Um, but what we ended up hearing a lot more than plovers was aircraft. And if you had asked me before we did this study, if you go to the beach, what are you gonna hear? I'm gonna be like, oh, you're hearing those prop planes pulling the advertisements that go back and forth, right? Well, we can characterize three different types of aircraft, helicopters, propeller planes, and jet planes all have different acoustic signatures. And we can look at how the number and type of aircraft passes occurred. We actually have data for identical weeks in 2020 and 2021 for three months. We have data July, September, and October. I cut off the October just so the graph would fit here. Um, and, and, you know, uh, what I thought was most abundant is not at all. It's, it's rich people flying in on jets and taking commuter helicopters. Those are by far uh, the biggest noises. And, and in a given week, you might have 1,600, 1,700, what we call events. So those are events where we could clearly detect an aircraft signal. Um, we started looking at whether uh, the, the birds were reacting to this. So like before, during, and after an overflight, were, were they changing their vocal behavior? Uh, the data there are kind of mixed. So it may be that they've, they've acclimated to this, right? It's just, it's a noisy place. But in terms of the soundscape, these green bars represent what the, how loud it is. So this is a really loud event. This is a quiet event over the, the course of our sample period. And then these blue dots represent those aircraft flyovers. So those aircraft events are nearly all of the really loud events that occur at the beach. It can also be really loud at the beach if it's really windy, if there's a storm, but it's mostly aircraft noise is the dominant signal we see um, there. Okay, I'm gonna fly through this really quickly. This is, I'm done talking about my students. Um, quick plug, come to their thesis presentations. They're gonna go into much more detail and be awesome. Um, we've got a project uh, that I did a couple of years ago in the Philippines. Um, Philippines, 7,000 islands. Uh, they're 10th in the world in seafood production, uh, growing population that eats a lot of fish. So this is a, a food security issue um, in terms of how much fish they have there for their, their population. So we were trying to figure out if we could use active or passive acoustics. Did it matter where you did this? And, and does it depend on how they're fishing? So they do a variety of different techniques for sardines, which is what we're focused on. Uh, they have boats, these outrigger boats. They put lights out at night and then they use lift nets. They have some permanent structures with nets underneath. They run generators, attract fish, pull up the nets. A variety of different techniques they use. Um, and then you go to the fish market and you can, you can buy the fish. Uh, so we went there, we bought some fish. This is a, a variety of different species, but, but there's sort of three sardines that kind of dominate the, the catch in these areas. Uh, we had a little side project in a place called Moal Boal. And if you're, if you're on the YouTubes, uh, Moal Boal is famous for the sardine school that shows up every day. And so there are numerous tour operators that will take you diving or snorkeling by uh, what they say is a millions of sardines in the Philippines. So we were there and we decided to investigate, um, you know, can we quantify how many fish are actually there? It's a lot um, and you don't want to try and count them by hand. Um, this shoal shows up regularly for about the last five years. It is also fished. So some fishermen who, who need the fish or the money are, are fishing it. Um, and so what we were trying to do is what's the economic value of this school as a fished resource versus a tourism resource? And could we actually quantify how many fish there are? So this is my gear rigged up on, it's the first time I've uh, hose clamped my gear to bamboo, uh, but it works great. Um, we can run everything off the, the boat batteries and we can do a survey and we, well, we couldn't do a survey because there's a bunch of snorkelers and divers, right? So what we could do is we could sort of set up anchor. And before, if you were looking at this, you might say, oh, this is the sea floor because it's red and in those other plots, that was the sea floor. Nope, that's the fish school. This is the sea floor and you only, and it's a reef, it's a reef shelf. The only time you see that is when the fish swim away. So the fish scatter so much sound 
the echoes don't actually make it all the way to the bottom of the ocean at that place. Um, but we can, we can, we know how big the fish are. We measured their swim bladders. We can come up with roughly how many fish, what the numerical density of fish are in that school. We can measure the height of the school from our acoustics. To get the spatial extent of these schools, we actually use some drones. We, we use YouTube footage and also flew some drones. And here's an image of one of these schools. So we can come up with rough estimates. Um, and there's, there's typically about 150,000 fish in that school. So first thing, don't believe YouTube titles. Uh, and secondly, you know, it's a uh, hundred times, a thousand times more valuable as a tourism resource than it is as a fishery. And what's really exciting to me about this project is this kind of showed we could do this and we got buy-in from BFAR, which is the basically the Philippine NIPS, the Philippines Fishery Agency. So uh, with colleagues from Cornell University and the Environmental Defense Fund, we put GPS trackers on fishing vessels to look at where the fishing activity occurred. And I'm heading over there in three weeks, I think. Uh, and we're gonna do some surveys of that area. And more importantly, we're giving two echo sounder setups to BFAR to run their own surveys, collect their own data. And then we're gonna have some follow-ups trying to get them up to speed in terms of um, analyzing the data and building up their, their fishery assessment infrastructure. Okay, last thing, it's only four slides. Grad students, this is like a basic question we should know. How do baleen whales find food, right? There's a variety of different sensory mechanisms they could use. They probably use some combination of those depending on the, the range scale, the distance scale that they're looking at. But if you're trying to find these mobile, patchily distributed animals, how are you best able to do that? So uh, the best way to do this is you go to Antarctica. Well, it's not the best way, it's the most fun way to do this. Uh, you go to, an Antar go to Antarctica, and you put a suction cup tag on the back of a humpback whale. And that suction cup tag has the same sensors as your phone in terms of knowing when to rotate your screen. So it's got gyroscopes, magnetometers, accelerometers. And when we get that tag back, and you have to get the tag back, and it's not fun when the tag comes up under a field of ice and you spend four hours in a Zodiac flipping over ice chunks to find the tag. Um, but when you get that tag back, you can recreate the animal's movements underwater. So you can look at how deep it dove, you can look at when it turns, uh, all sorts of things. We can run our echo sounders. So this is an echo sounder display in the Zodiac. Um, and this is the same Zodiac where we were running a, a chemical sensor that was measuring dimethyl sulfide, which is a chemical compound that's been associated as a foraging cue for seabirds. <coughs> And it occurs when phytoplankton cells break down. We're measuring it in both air and water. And so we're making simultaneous measurements of prey, a possible prey signal, a chemical cue for the prey, and the animal behavior. The other fun fact is we were actually running two different Wi-Fi networks on our Zodiac. So I think that was an IT accomplishment. So what, what do we find, at least on my end of things? So here's an echogram. And these are dense aggregations of krill. This is the dive path of that humpback whale. And the green squares represent every time the whale opens its mouth to feed. And so what, what's really clear here is this is a lazy whale. It is diving down basically one body length, taking a gulp and coming back up to the surface and just doing that over and over again until either the prey goes away or it's, it's satiated. There are denser aggregations of prey deeper, but it doesn't need to expend the energy to go down there. It's fine just with this. So this was data we collected. We, did, we had two field seasons down there, and then the pandemic happened. So our Antarctic analysis has kind of uh, been slowed up by that. But we've done some work here in uh, New England over in Cape Cod, where we did similar study where we measured prey, the chemical compound, and we found that there are DMS gradients in the ocean that are related to prey abundance. And we built little theoretical whales 
and we put them into this prey field and said, if they follow some basic rules like turn right, if you think there's more prey here or if there's a PMS signal here, they would encounter more food. And so we had that paper come out uh, in 2021. And the goal is to try and test this in some other regions uh, like Antarctica. Okay, sorry, I think I ran a little bit late. That was a lot of information, but thanks for hanging in there. Happy to answer questions. Oh, Shep has a question. Hi, Joe. Uh, that was really cool. I really enjoyed it. I haven't seen many talks where data is presented in units of grunts per day. So I learned a lot here. You haven't um, worked with Brad Peterson enough. Yeah, apparently not. Um, so um, you are well aware, I think, that Orsted has a publicly touted commitment that their wind farm installations will have a net positive impact on marine biodiversity. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on just how crazy ambitious um, a task it would be on a reasonable, sensible physical scale to assess that. That is, you know, for zooplankton, how, how much data over how many years, uh, you know, what fraction of the continental shelf, um, uh, you know, how much diurnal variability and inter interannual variability would you need to capture the natural variability and trends in zooplankton abundance to tackle that? Or, or Maybe they're not really serious and it's all PR, but uh, you can take that question and do whatever you want to with it. Yeah, so I mean, I think it, it depends if we are technically are talking about biodiversity or are we talking about like ecosystem health or biomass abundance? Because, you know, biodiversity, are we gonna get different fish species in New York waters because they're putting wind farms here than, than we had before? Maybe, but that wouldn't be my first inclination. Are we going to have a, a new suite of copepods that come in here? Possible, maybe, but again, I, I doubt it. But in terms of aggregating those animals, concentrating them, maybe changing their distribution, which may increase their abundance, um, you know, it's, it's really complicated. Like you said, it's not just the, the time series aspect, it's, it's fine scale processes. So like the, the Europeans are really ahead of us in terms of well, they're ahead of us because they have wind installations over there that have been operating for years. Looking at things like the, the wake behind uh, windmill posts, that's not the technical word, but that's what I'm going to call them, as the tide changes, right? So the tide's going to drive water past them this way, and then a little while later, it's going to go back the other way. And there's mixing. There's vortices that spin off that. And that's going to change the stratification. It may actually vertically mix organisms in the water column. So you might have this, this stir mechanism that occurs twice a day at all these sites. Is it going to impact things 10 kilometers away? No. Is it going to impact things five meters away? Probably. Um, but is that going to be enough to actually like change the ecosystem? I don't, I don't think we know. Um, and so it's really hard. I, I mean, I think the, the wind companies are, you know, it's, it's, it's just like the Navy. Like the Navy gets a lot of negative press because they use sonar in the ocean and they contribute to the noise level in the ocean. But the Navy's goal is not to, to hurt marine mammals. The Navy's goal is to um, you know, defend our country. And, and so it's, it's not efficient for them to injure whales if they can avoid it. And so in my mind, the wind companies kind of, I don't know, should I say this? I don't know. That's like, I think some of their their goal, right? They're, We're in Las like, Vegas here. Yeah, they're going to catch a lot of flack if there are negative impacts to the ecosystem, you know, from the installations. <laughs> what, you know, I think we, the best thing we can do is try and measure things before, during, and after. And, and one thing that people forget is, you know, these installations have a projected lifetime, right? 30, 40 years down the road. And then they're going to get dismantled or removed or decommissioned 
where they're gonna get transitioned to a new technology. And so any study that's looking at the impacts of these is, is arguably gonna be like several academic careers long, right? I'm not gonna be the one who does the post commission follow-up. I'm gonna be sitting on a beach somewhere, you know, hopefully. Um, so it's just, it's, uh, you know, these, these two year and six year studies are necessary, but, but long-term changes to the ecosystem require decade long studies. Well, you'll have to let us know if, if there's a connection there to our hiring plan. All right, enough from me. Thanks, Joe. Okay. Other questions? Joe, this is Malcolm. I, yeah. I, I have a question and comment. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And underwater acoustics was my first love and my first uh, entry into marine science. But my responsibility was helping track Soviet submarines during the Cold, Cold War, but acoustically. But I was thinking of doing a postdoc at Scripps, and the idea I had was to, to see whether you could create using a phased array of multiple active hydrophones on like a big circular disc as a, and then adjusting the phase across these 50 hydrophones. And so you get a collimated beam, acoustic beam, but, but like a, a laser in optics and get reflections of individual fish in this case. And what comes back is really a, like an acoustic hologram. And if you could process that, maybe this might lead to being able to identify certain types of fish rather than just big blobs of them. Yep. No, so, that's, so, so that technology exists. They're called imaging sonars. They use very high frequencies. They are uh, uh, multiple transmitters. Uh, they do the high frequency so they can get the fine detail resolution, but that also means they can't see very far. So, yeah. so imaging sonars maybe operate two to 10 meter kind of ranges. Um, but oh. yeah, those are a complementary tool to our echo sounders. I actually am, am reviewing a paper that was looking at uh, the impacts of the Block Island wind farm on the fish aggregations. And they were doing a combination imaging sonar and echo sounder survey. Um, and it's due today and I haven't yet started it. So it'll be a little late, but, but that's, that's a tool. Brad and I have been trying to get a, an imaging sonar to do some work in the Peconics looking underneath aquaculture gear because it's it's a weird thing because it's it's a sonar system but you end up doing image processing like you mm. you don't need a sonar person to run well you need a sonar person to run it but to analyze the data you need a, a vision image processor person well the the advantage of acoustic holography over uh, uh, visible light holography is that you can actually measure the phase of the wave coming back towards you Whereas in optics, you can just measure the intensity. Yep. Anyway, thanks very much for an interesting chat. A couple more questions. All right, Brad. Had Brad. Oh, is there somebody else besides Brad? I'm, I can talk to Brad anytime. Happy to talk to somebody well, else. Maybe you have something that you've already. I was just I was curious about how, how does like turbidity, like turbidity in your water affect your impact? Yep. Is it how? So uh, suspended sediments are very strong scatterers because they're dense and, uh, and they can remain in the water column. My very first entry into acoustics as a summer student was analyzing sediment transport data from a river mouth out in California. So I, I went to Woods Hole and then I sat in front of a computer for three months. Uh, and then I decided I was gonna do a bunch of field work after that. But so you can see that like with our observatory data in the Gulf of Maine, we've We've got a colleague who has a wire walker that's running a standard turbidity fluorometer sensor nearby. And so we've got some ground truthing data because that's an optical sensor looking at turbidity. So we can see some of those plumes when they kick up. And it, it depends on how, how much stuff comes up, whether that actually limits our uh, reach, you know, how far our sonar systems can see. The bigger okay. issue- I guess my question is how, how does your turbidity affect you? reduce the range or does it like yeah it just, yeah so the bigger issue we have with with ship based systems is we have bubbles that get swept underneath the hull and bubbles are really strong scatters so we we don't get as much power so we can't see as far when we have a lot of bubble activity with bottom looking sensors if you had a big sediment plume then that would do the same thing it would knock down your signal to noise ratio basically but you could also you can measure it like you can measure 
particle concentrations and, and quantify that, which is what we were doing with that, that river stuff. So, yeah. Okay, well, that was super interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Last one. Um, So I can whale and dolphin very different. Fin whale and blue whale, I can tell the difference because they have characteristics. Blue whale calls are lower, fin whale calls are 20 hertz, psi whales are a little bit uh, higher frequency. Um, I have two different dolphins doing echolocation clicks. I can't probably tell them apart. Sperm whale echolocating, bottlenose dolphin echolocating, maybe, but that's because they're bigger, the spacing's different, the frequency range is different. Um, in terms of automated, it's it's really tough. So like we we borrowed a COD, well not borrowed, we people published a COD detector that they were using in New England. We ran that and it works pretty well for our area. But every site has different recorders, different background noise. Like we have a lot of boat traffic at our site. One of the sites we had a chain clanking for like the first six months we have data. And so that you couldn't do any automated processing. You had to go through that by hand, which was super time consuming. So uh, it's very case dependent. And we still don't know, like the bulk of, maybe not, yeah, the bulk of what we hear is, I don't know, you know. And the, the best, the best, the first studies on sounds that fish made were done by taking a fish in a tank in the lab and either poking it or shocking it and it would make a noise. And that was, that was the first data we had on what those noises were. And, we don't really have a lot of that ground truthing information as much as we want. Yeah. All right. Well, I think the uh, discussions can continue over um, pizza. Yes. So thanks so much. <laughs>